<clears throat> Welcome, everyone. There is a uh, seat available <laughs> up here in the front if anybody wants to have a comfortable seat where you can actually see what's going on. I don't bite, just come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's, uh, it's my distinct pleasure to uh, have Bjorn here. Not least because he's probably the tallest man in the division. <laughs> <laughs> Because he's been doing some of the most interesting work. I had the pleasure of uh, spending a lovely week with him in uh, the research prison of Germany, otherwise known as Dogstuhl. Um, but uh, he's had a bunch of things, including the new model. It's something that we've continued somewhat in my group. Please uh, take away, and there are seats in the front if uh, Uh, so, Jordan is at uh, Munich now. The title before that, uh, the PhD at ETA, won a bunch of awards there. Did a postdoc in Berkeley, Yatendra, and is pretty heavily involved in. Something a little something is it stable fusion? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anybody's heard about that or seen any of it. If you haven't, then uh, you missed out. Uh, uh, great to be here um, before I'm heading out in a few minutes, hours, wherever. Uh, didn't have much time to see uh, Vancouver this time around. Uh, we'll be playing with that love. I have uh, the pleasure of like a few minutes. That's, 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 that's why you're here. So, so you can see my slides, but at least this is my tour for, for this time around because there was definitely not much touristy things involved. So, um, Gentive AI, I believe. Um, has really come to a turning point. They're a turning point in the way that we will in the future process, analyze, and create visual content. Um, I believe that this will have profound implications on all disciplines involved with images, which tests pretty much all of industry and society, research and so on, everywhere we will be meeting with images. Um, at the same time, this technology comes with its very own limitations, and I would love to spend a few minutes with you discussing these limitations, see ways that we can actually tackle them, uh, but I mean, that's no final solutions there, there's a lot to see, so let's see where we stand in terms of how computers can support us in the future. Um, just very brief intro here, uh, we all know that machines are done, they need to learn before they're able to do anything. Uh, need to learn from training data, and there are two opposite approaches to do that. The first would be this kind of approaches, where you essentially take a, a, a machine learning algorithm, simply directly learning, trying to learn the task. Um, and the uh, alternative one is having experimental models, where you don't care about any task. The only thing that you have to want to do is um, try to learn to represent the data distribution. I find this interesting because on the left hand side, we now have solution, which is essentially uh, not focusing so much on the data itself, but actually learning to simply uh, represent the decision surface between the data, but not the data um, themselves, um, as opposed to generative models, which don't have any particular task in mind, you don't have to do is actually learn to represent the data distribution, and then you can post hoc um, uh, fine tune that for whatever task. Um, uh, just brief start there. Um, my group is, besides visual synthesis, interested in a bunch of other things. Um, metric learning um, approaches that uh, particular are going in the direction of transfer learning out of domain generalization, which I believe is kind of the voting rate of what we're doing in machine learning, um, generalizing, ideally generalizing to uh, data distributions. If you haven't seen beforehand, I find it very interesting to build models that uh, are not just ramping up performance of various tasks, but also making sure that they're transparent, interpretable, 
um, for a lot of reasons. Um, I guess this one starts to become more and more clear and self-explanatory um, learning from data. Um, data is fairly cheap compared to annotations. That's why for a long time I've been super much interested in self-supervised learning approaches and empathy, um, visual synthesis. Just to, um, just to be clear, can everybody in the back here, if you're not there, no. Yeah. If, okay. if you get, I know you, 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 you suffer from a low voice like me, but you know, all, all, all. And, and politeness unlike me. So. Yeah. So um, let me just very briefly say a few words about metric learning and um, uh, pitch your work that we presented this conference uh, a day ago or so, which I had to do a poster session about because my students, of course, could be a bit of a for Canada there. Yeah, so that's the metric learning there. What do we want to do in metric learning, representation learning? The idea is that we want to learn semantic relationships between images. I guess it's clear to everybody that you cannot compare images in the pixel space, or you should not, and that would be a weird thing to do. And the metric learning essentially tries to learn similarity by essentially taking our humble images here and projecting them into a space where an existing metric is scalar products, whatever, uh, L2 is going to do the trick for you. So it's taking the data and learn a projection into a metric space so that we can go about. Um, this mapping here these days is evidently <coughs> highly complicated nonlinear mapping in your network these days. And the question is really a challenge how you generalize there. Um, my group had a whole bunch of work going in that direction um, and investigating how we can do that not in a purely discriminative manner, but how we can also combine um, unsupervised regenerative approaches in there. I had a PAMI paper a half a year ago on um, uh, sharing matters, how we can actually do like um, uh, utilize the non discriminative part of the world as well. But I want to just highlight here um, one, one recent addition to that game. And with that, we can also see how the ML really works. So you take an image, you have here your encoding network, typically a resonant address, in our case, for instance, using spatial encoding of your images. And DML is then all about this tiny triangle here. Which is essentially taking this rich, spatially rich feature vector that you have and learning embedding, uh, condensing that to a small, compact feature vector. So that this feature vector then lives in a Euclidean whatever metric space, and you can take the metric from this space to um, then relate the images to such a computer similarity. Now, um, this is all fair and well. Um, this is all fair and well. The only problem that you think about that is that everything now hinges on a pooling function. All that we're doing there is pooling to solve one of the most complicated things out there in computer vision, uh, taking a rich representation of the image and projecting that to a feature vector, which conveys semantic similarity. Um, that is tricky. Now, here's my image. If I'm just looking at the image, what matters to convey semantic similarity? Semantic similarity to what? It's just a sim singular image, right? If I had the image that I'm comparing against, you would in that case say, like, that, forget about all of this stuff up there. It's just the stand of the chair, which matters. I mean, that's the only thing that they have in common. And lo and behold, yeah, that's what you would want to concentrate on. So if you were to project this down to something very low dimensional, if you knew what you're comparing against, then this would be leading to a much more informed decision, meaning that your pooling can be much more. However, we, at the end of the day, I want to do this on a per image basis. But during training, during just come in, I mean, there's, there's plenty of space there. Um, during training, we, however, have pairs of images available. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here. During training, use pairs of images and don't just do pooling, um, these humble pooling operations that we've developed in the decades, but utilize powerful cross attention with the idea that I can now take my rich feature vectors and essentially modulate these feature vectors by means of the other image. So I take one image and I take the other image to cross attention between these two. And now rather than having just a mere pooling operation, I can cross attention, really take the rich features and have the other image select what I want to pull together. Yeah? So it's a, a learn to nonlinear pooling function, a highly informed pooling function, which takes the other image to inform where should it be pooling? Um, I can then do that the other way around. Uh, so I have image J, image I, and uh, image I and J, whatever it is. You have here a traditional sort of representation of image I that you started with. You get that again. And I guess we all agree if you take this representation and you have the, here the other image comes in essentially, 
that will lead to a better feature representation. Yeah, my, my, my distilled representation of the image has now seen the, the other image in that process. Now we repeat this process n times. Right? So just repeat this and always uh, get the information in. And that's where you're then going. Yeah, so the cross attention process is on and on and on, taking information from the other image until you get a better embedding image okay, during training. That then gives you improved similarities as opposed to just this hello pooling there, which you can compare. We have ground truth provided. We know whether it's adjustment or not. And DML is typically a contrastive loss, multi similarity loss, or whatever else it is. You then utilize that, get gradients. The gradients go all the way back, improve your pooling, improve your encoding that you had here. And then during inference, you throw all of this part of your way, meaning deep metric growing for those that are in the field. It's exactly the same thing doing as it's always been. No extra parameters. Now, it's just during training, we thought, like, why only look at an individual image if I have the pairs or triples of images provided? Anyhow, just very briefly to wrap this part up, this is a number of blocks in the cross attention process here, how wide this is. Um, and we see that this easily sort of stops at around like six blocks. So you don't want to make them too large. It makes sense, right? That would make it overfitting. And this is the number of steps, the number of iterations that we do here. Um, and you can also see that it separates at a number of like four steps or something like that, and that the gradients don't go back again. And what you get is implicitly, as you're comparing images, um, attention maps being learned. Something that tells you, hey, look at the beak of the bird, look at its tail when you're comparing two birds with another. Now, in standard DML, we're just taking this here. One holistic feature vector. There's no spatial representation anymore. I don't know why two images are similar. Here we have implicitly learned how and why images are similar. Just come in. I mean, there's there's place there, and another chair there. Yeah. For those. Yeah, I've I just noticed. <laughs> I, I I really <laughs> literally the just second rows okay, just first just put this in. Are, 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 yeah, no, I, I was just throwing in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I, just I, saw, I saw the rapid click. Yeah. Sorry that you clicked away. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I just sorry. noticed you, but I guess the idea that's why I said like this should be. Uh, I, I just did a question. So, who needs a Do you select the only solution in one image so for a typical internal representation for the IP cross attention or this from the data? The cross attention co comes from. Also, no, nobody will be able to hear the question, so if you want to repeat or summarize the so question. Yeah. I guess your question was like the cross yeah. attention is coming from the other end. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So here you take the, the rich features, this, this encoding here from one image, and in the process of figuring out how to pull that essentially, you consider the other image. So the second image tells you what information you take from this to actually pull it together. Yeah, so standard pooling is just this. And now we take the other image to form this pooling process. And the pooling is uh, just the uh, so just mean weights based on the key and values, right? So yeah, yeah. And I uh, know I, I actually my question is so this here is just the standard process. I have this alter, this all this alternates for the IIT image. Yeah, it does. Oh, it, it does. does. It does. And th then it has because here you have your rich feature presentation, which is formed by that. That's why I have this here twice. Yeah, and this okay. is all these things which are just like very brief. That, that's why we're doing it twice. If you do it twice, you have a poor eye that and these are details. Yeah, and, and when, when, when we said this operation is formats, we just use the final weights. Yeah. Okay. For, for inference, you just use it's the same architecture as you always have to yeah. you know, it's just information back. Yeah, so Bjorn, if I understood you correctly, so you're defining the similarity by, so if there is a common subregion, then you define the images as being similar. Is and not necessarily. So, I, you know, as usually in DML, you have um, this, this rich encoding being pulled together to some compact representation, and similarity lives in that space. So, the assumption is this is some metric space where I have Euclidean, whatever metric I predefined. I think maybe to, 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 what, is, what is the final task? Okay. So the final task in DML, or what's the training objective? Yeah. The training objective in deep metric learning is contrastive learning. So you take an anchor and a positive, so two samples which come from the same class, and a negative which comes from a different class. You want to say anchor positive close, the negative is far away. That's your training objective. During inference, you then get a representation with that. 
with this representation in DML, you can do all sorts of things. You can, for instance, the nearest neighbor retrieval uh, and take a sample and then figure out what the nearest ones are to classification tasks and all of those kind of things. The, the sole point is here I can learn a representation of the image, which I then can utilize, which are more informed. It's, it's living in a semantic space so that I can do these kind of things. Yeah. So I get this here representation where similar identities are close. Other ones are further away. So I might have two questions. But the first one is sorry, if I understand that correctly, so are you learning the embeddings conditionally? But then at inference time it's unconditional. Exactly. So what's to make us believe that it will perform well when you do it on condition since it's trained to do so condition? Because yeah. at the start of this training process, it's this one here. And you backpop the error through this process to, to update this pooling representation, which gives you the aggregation of this rich effective knowledge that you have in here. You're in this process, however, utilizing information from the other image as well as information. The information goes all the way back to you, also updating the encoding. So in DML, you always update the pooling and you update your encoding network so that you have the same, not just updating this part, but you're also updating the uh, the discriminator um, loss that you have there, the same game as. Yeah. Let me make my question more precise. I'm talking about the conditional embedding, right? So, the conditional embedding gives the cross attention. You're focusing on regions that are shared in some sense between two images in a pair, right? Uh, because you're conditioning yeah. on the things yeah. that are. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but then. How can you then, when you do metric learning, distinguish between images that you know of two chairs that only share the same foot and you know chairs that are actually completely similar? Because at the end of the day, I have this here, and this phi zero is this is what the unconditional one is what I'm using for the variant. Yeah, because if if it, if it were just for that, I agree. I, then you need this other part, then it's still a conditional. We are at the end of the day using this yeah. year, and we have some follow up work which actually uses the Yeah. Same thing with X. Yeah, 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 sir. <laughs> but so, so this is clip, clip your point up. Yeah, I mean, there's a bit more to do there, but yeah, I mean, this is kind of this that's and, that's and, that's and that's the that's other that's these are things that we're present investigating. It's been very tricky. <laughs> There are still a few things that we still need to sort of get going together there, but yeah, you can't have to combine with each other. Yeah. Just a small yeah. thing, but and who knows like a rest or something? Yeah, that's typically a rest at 50 or something like that. For those that have seen deep metric learning, yes, there have been approaches based on attention. Um, uh, there have been approaches based on attention, um, based on transformer architectures. But they, in that case, just replace the original feature encoding that you have there. And sure, you can take your ResNet 50, ResNet 100, Transformer, or whatever else, you can wrap up performance. DML, for that reason, has, as a, as a community, agreed on like using the same features, because other than that, uh, you get progress by just using larger features. And that's why I, mean, I hope you see here, we have not changed in any way the representation, dimensionality, the architecture. It stays exactly the same thing. We're just showing that during training where I have the other image provided, it would be nonsense not using that. If you're training on triplets later on, but you're just using one image, why do that? And that's what motivated us to go in the direction. But you still rely on triplets after your customers. That's that's my point. We are not changing the encoding, we're not changing the pooling, and we are not changing however you would want to mine, like negative mining or whatever else you have, whether you do an additional um, collaboration techniques and so on ensemble methods I and mean, all of that here is separate right the architecture is exactly the same the only thing that we have changed is <coughs> that this was but the uh, disadvantage of that is usually that it's very over the distribution data right because of the classes you have seen and the negatives you're mining right okay, so so my point is like we wanted to build something which is transparent which does not change the way that you want to do dml and this you can combine with whatever you want to do. There are fixes uh, to hard negative mining and so on, which have been proposed. I mean, this community has all sorts of loss functions, all sorts of mining, as you know. And this is independent from whatever you're doing there. So these fixes there, there you can do with a model here. 
it's in here. You said nothing how you sample. This is just a standard way that's going on in DML and can be used for that. So it's just independent from that. Okay, good. And let's switch gears to the generative side of the world. I mean, this was just something that I briefly uh, was coming in this morning for those that are more in the discriminative side uh, and, and do beautiful things like, right, I want to see a sunset over a mountain range or for that matter, the so they close to UBC and um, then you wait a second or so to get this out. And you say like, no, 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 it should be a vector image. And the system puts together that. There's more things than just do text to image. Uh, system allows you also to do in painting, uh, take the image to say like, what is behind um, this tree there and reconstruct um, the rest to hallucinate it, come up with uh, assumptions about that, do the CSI things, uh, make larger. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, or take preppy images as probably like my uh, artistic abilities there and turn it into something more beautiful. Now, as we all know, generative models have been around for a while, uh, but they have so far suffered from a classical dilemma. And I guess that's also why we as a community had issues to make further progress. Classical dilemma being like, we all want to have great sample quality, right? I mean, when I'm rendering something, please make sure that it's beautiful. And generative adversary networks are a great example of that. You get nice looking samples, but unfortunately, only kind of few of them there for homing in on part of your data distribution mode collapse. The alternative to that would be variational autoencoders, approaches that seek to cover all of the data that is there. But with that, if you do all, then you're doing nothing really right. Yeah, in that case, you have this, this compromise there. Uh, great data coverage, but the quality is suffering. Um, and um, recently, powerful likelihood models have emerged. Autoregressive transformers, great. Yeah? Only that reading images, like you would read text. I mean, if I were a tiger, I would probably hide in the bottom right corner. Uh, that doesn't make too much sense. And there are a few other things um, with this architecture. And that's why diffusion models I find super interesting. Although from transformers, there will be a few things in there, as you're seeing here. Um, they're score-based, uh, meaning that they're flexible with respect to the architecture that we're going for. Um, no partition function anymore, right? Yeah. Um, they have a stable training objective, no mini-max optimization. Uh, all this scan training, which was so tricky, it's out. We have a Latin variable, which allows us to easily like um, uh, sample or edit the samples that we're having there, but they're expensive. They're expensive due to the long markup chain that we're having there. And yesterday, uh, one of my grad students presented um, uh, one of those, or it's a way to like dense these architectures together, but still like make it an expensive process. Uh, let's briefly see why that is the case for those um, that haven't seen diffusion models beforehand. Just in a nutshell, you take a, um, a training image as you're seeing here. Uh, and you add uh, noise to this image a tiny bit so that you and I will not notice the difference. But if you do this a hundred or a thousand times, the end result looks like you have a cable from your TV set, uh, just pure noise there. Now, why in the world did I remove all the content in the image? Evidently, to turn this around, self supervision, and have a neural network take something which is noisy and make it a tiny bit less noisy. I guess we can all agree that a neural network should get this tiny bit of noise out there. Yeah, you utilize a denoising autoencoder or something along those lines. Um, for us, it's a unit you know, architecture there, but we played around using transformers with that in the image part paper that you heard from one hand. Um, it turns out this humble architecture is more efficient. And the kicker is it's the same parameters all the way. Uh, that uh, helps quite a bit with regularization. And what you get at the end of the day, something nice. You're getting a semantic hierarchy. You're not getting like a progressive growing of guns and similar approaches, something which increases in terms of the resolution, or in that case, decreases in the resolution. You're not getting something which is getting more and more blurry. No, you're getting images that um, have less and less of the semantic details of your original image. But that you're getting in semantic hierarchy. Now, the power of these powerful likelihood models their strength is at the same time kind of becoming also um, a curse for them. They're homing in on each tiny bit of your data distribution, trying to capture even the tiniest imperceptible details um, that you and I would not care about. 
Uh, so most of the bits in this rate distortion curve are actually allotted to details, which I cannot even notice there. And comparably, the few bits go to distinguishing whether this here is a male or a female face, whether a person wearing glasses or not, length of hair, and so on. How can we make sure that we have more bits where we actually care about semantic details? Um, two solutions. One is the brute force approach. Just ramp up the model size and the entire curve will, uh, will move to the top right. Um, and the other is um, try to focus more on meaningful details. Now, um, scaling up performance by simply increasing model size, we've been there, right? I study one, uh, 12 billion parameters. Um, okay, and you can do that if you want. Um, might not be the most beautiful approach, but I also see like some long term problems. You really want to solve all the problems in the world that way. Um, what do you do with the long tailed distributions that our nature throws at us? If you're in IKEA world, yeah, you will finally get all the pretty, get all the pretty shelves that are out there, yeah, and you don't need to see that many more images. But what do you do with Da Vinci's beautiful painting there? There's only one side of the Vinci in the world, yeah. In getting this long tail distribution by just scaling things up, I need mean, to really exponentially scale things up. Um, enormous cost, not just in terms of uh, money, but also CO2, carbon footprint, and so on. And it requires not just for training, but this was important for me here, it requires even to inference um, server hardware. And with that comes the problem that only a few players in a short amount of time will have the necessary resources, not just for training but also for running during train models. That I found a bit tricky uh, being a scientist in our whole CPPR community, because it means less diversity, less creativity. If it's just a handful of companies in the foreseeable future, being able to have the resources to not just do the training, but really host those models. It means a monopoly on what I believe will become a crucial technology for our societies, for industry, research, everything else. And then there are additional things, data privacy and so on, if you have to ship it over to some other country. country. So the question was very simple that we asked ourselves, can we democratize research and further development in this field by simply rendering smaller models more effective rather than just ramping them up in their size? And our goal was therefore to democratize by not just making these models more powerful, but at the same time accessible. Accessible meant not just releasing open source, which we have done with stable diffusion, but at the same time, right from the bat, making the decision that what we are creating should be fit uh, should fit into consumer hardware for 300, 400 bucks. Graphics cards with 10 gigabytes of VRAM these days fits into your mobile phone. Yeah? And that means since you want to build a model that kind of knows about what's out there in the world, has learned to generate arbitrary images out in the world, you need to show it during training the world. Yeah? billions of training images, hundreds of terabytes worth of training data. Now you have hundreds of terabyte training data and you need to, at the end of the day, after you're learning, fit them into 10 gigabytes or even two gigabytes of your mobile phone, which means you essentially need to take the internet and make it fit into your pocket, your mobile phone. How can we do that? And I believe that is, I mean, that's what I'm super excited about. That's for me intelligence, being able to extract away all that crap out there and concentrate on important things in the data rather than just making my devices larger and, and host all the crap in there as well. Yeah, intelligence, I believe the key feed of intelligence is home in on the details that actually matter and get rid of all the rest. And I guess that's what as a community machine learning and so on should be all about. Now, how do we do that? Uh, we observed that powerful likelihood models are great for learning long range context, but they're not so great um, for uh, uh, representing local details. They're too expensive for them. Besides, um, convolutional neural networks, they have this great inductive bias, the receptive fields in modeling local details, but they're not great for learning long range interactions. Sure, you can stack them, yeah, but eventually, like long range communication will be super indirect, costly, and not very effective, right? We know this. Can we combine the benefits of both the um, powerful long range models with the ability to of continents to uh, represent local details um, efficiently? And that's exactly what we've done in um, stable diffusion and by proposing latent diffusion models. Um, 
you want to start with noise and synthesize images out of noise. But rather than doing that directly in the image domain, we do it in a latent domain. We have an encoder architecture, computational encoder, which um, essentially acts as a perception compressor, getting rid of all the details that we don't care about. Let's look at this dog here. You care about the color of the dog's fur, probably like how long the hairs roughly are, maybe even a bit of a direction. But you don't care about each individual hair, right? I mean, that's just texture. So what the what this Latin representation does there is sort of abstract away all the details that don't matter to you, and then have an encoder decoder architecture for training and um, learn a, a compression or a Latin space so that your generative model later on only works as a, as a probability distribution in this Latin space rather than directly on the pixels. And then this generative model, this powerful likelihood model, can concentrate on learning long range interactions. Um, I sense that in hindsight, that sounds like super clear. Yeah, why not do that that way? But when we were developing that, uh, and also discussing here and there with others, it sounded a bit crazy because, like, um, modeling these long range interactions directly in the pixel space, all of that, that seemed to be fairly clear, like, how to go about here. And that, after all, is still a convolutional architecture that we are having here with skip connections. You can see how the convolutions in there are nicely built to utilize, like, spatial structure and so on as opposed to some weird feature vectors that pop out here where each dimension means something crazily different uh, than, than something else and learning distributions between them um it worked it worked so at the end of the day you have here your forward diffusion process that turns the um, input into noise and here's your inverse process which is essentially the noise and units uh, with skip connections uh, but rather than doing that directly in the pixel space, we have here the encoder decoder architecture, which is trained um, by means of a reconstruction loss for those that um, you know. I mean, that, that's um, the, the DQ gun approach that we started uh, up here. And compared to um, the, the new type approaches, we have here uh, perceptual reconstruction loss and on top of that, um, an adversarial loss to favor um, quality here. Um, over uh, directly sort of pixel identity. The approach within this convolutional architecture here has cross attention layers injected in there. So they come to your attention, which allow you to take any other information, textual site information, images, whatever it is, and um, inform this denoising approach to inject site information to the the denoising essentially saying like hey you have something noisy and it's supposed to say to show an image of a tiger standing blah, blah, blah. yeah then uh, please denoise it in a way that you see more tiger and that allows you then to write i want to see a photograph of a mountain tree lake should be highly detailed photorealistic wait five ten seconds and out comes megapixel images of um, that size uh, in, in, in these contents there you're not just getting a single image, but you're getting multiple images, as many as you want. Image says more than a thousand words. If I just give you five words, evidently there are more coming out. This is an example of taking a semantic map, not ten semantic map in, and then just synthesizing three realizations which fit this semantic map. You see that the approach itself is deterministic apart from this noise at the beginning, so you can essentially roll the dice to get all of the things which are not captured by means of the text and sample over those, change weather and so on, which I haven't specified before. I'm just saying like, hey, this should be sky, but how cloudy it is and so on. This approach can then be utilized because of this arbitrary conditioning for a whole lot of different classes, text to image, layout to image, super resolution, completion of images, or even as you see here, um, depth to image. Um, just in painting very briefly, I can take an image and have the algorithm hallucinate what might be behind this tree or this person on the bench. And there come then multiple, um, multiple solutions out. And um, we've with that uh, achieved a state of the art in painting results, although the approach was never sort of built for in painting. And that's what I found interesting when we designed it that you can take this approach, which is just built to learn the data distribution, a generative approach. And utilize for a whole lot of downstream tasks and achieve pretty competitive performance. What recently I've seen, like most people, 
getting excited about was not so much just like pure text to image, but actually image to image with text guidance. Um, and then we use the um, very influential SD edit approach. So you take the image, add a bit of noise to this, and then have the backward process inject information. Information such as this, uh, taking a rendering, crappy rendering of a scene and saying like, hey, I mean, this here is supposed to be uh, Munich from Kirche and Alps the background, and please make it Monet or make it Van Gogh. Yeah, and then it turns some some rendering into another image. And you can do all of that. Hmm. This kind of approach um, then has become really starting point of a kind of Cambrian explosion of lots of creative uh, tools out there, which we haven't developed. I, I just found it interesting how many uh, artists, designers, researchers, this community here. Um, we're taking this up and came up with super exciting, like novel tools based on this approach. <coughs> Things that I would have here or there never imagined. Um, I mean, there's a search engine, image search engine, specifically developed for stable um, diffusion, where you can search images that others have created, look at their text prompts, if you need some inspiration. The approach has been integrated into Photoshop, Blender, Adobe After, After Effects. Um, then there are nice approaches such as ControlNet and just to, to pick one out of I don't know, thousands that in a few months came out afterwards, um, where people have done a really great approach, uh, great, great, great things on top of that, much better than, than what we had originally. And I just want to highlight one thing which uh, came out at the beginning of this year, which I just found crazy when I saw this. Um, uh, uh, Refusion, um, they, they have this idea like, what's audio? Well, I can take a spectrogram of audio, right? Which you see here. What's a spectrogram? That's an image. Stable diffusion can deal with images. Let's take stable diffusion, show it spectrograms, and take it pretty much out of the box, the fine tuning bit, and then that out of the box, and turn a spectrogram into another spectrogram, conditioned on some text, yeah, make it a punk bass line or whatever else there, and then turn stable diffusion into a spectrogram to spectrogram. Well, into an audio synthesis approach at the end of the day. Just by saying like, hmm, I can do a transition like of the domains before. Him. And that shows really how much of a foundation model we are actually having here that it can actually cater to entirely different domains. I mean, Google and others have uh, like within days brought up much better approaches than this year. That's not the way to go, but just the sheer fact that you, much like on LSD trip, yeah, you can you can see audio so to speak. I <laughs> theory. In theory, yeah, I mean, you can listen to that. I knew the music. I, again, there's better approaches out there, but um, that I found just interesting. Let me wrap this up uh, very quickly. Um, we've seen that we can combine the efficiency of convolutions with the expressiveness of this long range of likelihood models. Much more efficient uh, approaches allow us for high resolution synthesis, and this generic conditioning makes them able to solve a whole lot of different tasks. Uh, without having to do our architecture and it acts as a foundation model that you can generalize to entirely new novel tasks. So far, so far, I've shown you how to learn representations of images more effectively by combining these library models with conventional architecture. Now I want to spin this a tiny bit forward. What should you learn at all in a generative model? Not more effectively, but what at all should we learn there? What I mean with that? If we look at artists like Monet, when he was painting, he was sitting out there in the woods looking at trees. And I could like run a drake and say, like, a tree's a tree. Yeah, how many more trees do you actually you look at to get an idea how to paint a tree? Now, evidently, Monet was definitely orders, orders of magnitude more gifted than I would ever be even in the furthest imagination. And still, he thought that it's actually valuable to go out there and look at trees. Why that? Because you realize that nature comes with an infinite amount of um, diversity and variations out there. Uh, any day of the Pacific is going to be different. Any tree is going to be different. And just looking at that is evidently a source of inspiration. Storing that all in your neurons in your brain would be an awful bad way to do, which is exactly what we're doing. We're taking billions of training images and stuffing them into the very precious parameters that we do have in our neural network, storing all the world in there in these tiny parameters when we could do it like Monet. And just as we want to render, say like, hmm, show me a few trees, and then 
I know how to do, combine like the knowledge that I have in my few humble neurons there with the infinite amount of variability that nature throws at me whenever I look. So we were um, suggesting a paradigm shift. It's actually more like a, uh, a back to the future approach because as always, like Ayosha had done it already 20 years ago, now uh, with uh, Thomas Jung in this approach and in the NLP community, um, uh, this was also kind of there, an approach where we don't represent local details in the generative model at all. But we rather did a database of patch examples, uh, go through uh, a large set of patches and look up relevant patches for the local synthesis that you want to do. As you want to render your little tree there, you go to this database, take everything that you can from this database there to help your model. So in our case, that, mentioned, uh, that, that meant that we take like 9 million images, uh, crop like 20 million patches out of that, and whenever your powerful likelihood model, transformer or diffusion model, does not matter, um, wants to render something, it can focus on the composition of these local details rather than having to memorize the local details. How does that work out? It means that the training of the diffusion process, so we are essentially uh, advocating here for a semi parametric approach, the diffusion process or the auto regressive process you see here. And it wants to reconstruct the data as, as always, maximize the data. Yeah. But I hope you agree that while you want to approximate your data distribution here with your humble parameters that you have, it would help if upon doing that for, for this sample X here, I would know similar samples. When I want to render this ego here, somebody giving me these patches here, which are related, would probably make the task of rendering this ego significantly more easy here and that's exactly what we're doing getting conditioning site information in to make this decision here a little bit more informed make it easier uh, so we take the sample look for similar things uh nearest neighbors from our data set and then utilize them here not directly i will pipe them through a fixed clip embedding uh, to make life a little bit easier and this then makes this process easier and you know, during inference during yeah just a historical artifact that you presented the first step, which is a better clip of any. The meaning what? Which one? You could use your embedding rather than yeah. your embedding. We could technically use that. Um, we started just with a fixed clip here because it's, it's there. Yeah, it's there. Uh, so I am future work, sure. Uh, train this together with your approach. This is fixed, right? I mean, yeah. you could, of course, train this as you're training the diffusion model. Here's narrow neighbor retrieval. You could train this psi function up there together with the rest of the These are evident avenues where we could investigate further. This was just the most simple things to do and work. Yeah. So I need to stress during inference, we need absolutely no access to the training data. The distribution, the database that we're using here is not the training type. Can, but you don't need to. This can be any arbitrary data set. Um, as a matter of fact, you can actually change the database and you can also change your conditioning algorithm. You can do that based on, hey, I want to see a tiger. Or you can give a, a text sequence and say, like, I want to see a beautiful I don't know, forest with a tiger in there and some other in the background. You could use an image to do that retrieval, whatever. You can use different ways for, for this side function to do the retrieval. And um, you can utilize different databases during training during inference. And as a brief take home message here, it turns out that more, the more different the training and the test task is, the more you want to transfer away from the, um, the training distribution, um, the more gain you actually get from having this retrieval augmentation, which I believe makes sense, right? And in that case, having uh, additional images during inference time is definitely. And with that uh, comes some interesting sort of observations. Uh, let's assume you train a model on ImageNet to do ImageNet synthesis, as we all do. Um, and then during inference, post hoc, after training is completed, you simply swap the database from ImageNet to BDART. And you get like a zero shock transfer from the image distribution over to BDART, so style transfer, without ever having trained on style transfer. You simply say, like, as you're rendering a basket full of fruits, yeah, 
but my patches now come from some artistic images and the approach learns as it's synthesizing to to then condition on these more artistic images and you see this domain shift then being done post hoc and that's what i find kind of interesting what you can potentially utilize that for now last thing you may wonder why do that uh, because retrieval augmentation should be costly yeah yeah sorry previous previous like how do you know the correspondence of patches between the two data sets just having your retrieval algorithm there giving you as you're rendering something nearest neighbors from that database yeah and that is then drawing your respective patches from this database as opposed to that database so for us it was clip based similarity that we utilized nothing more in the future model the cross attempt to yeah yeah so, so um non-parametric approaches uh, typically make life during inference harder, right? Because then you have essentially pushed effort from there, but not so in that case. Um, thanks to Google, scan um, approximate nearest neighbors, uh, lets us um, select um, relevant samples in roughly 100 milliseconds out of a database of 20 million patches. So that's applicable compared to the rest of the synthesis approach. And when doing that, we need now fewer parameters in our neural network. Yeah, because evidently everything that comes from the database, then we need fewer parameters to store the samples because the rest is done by the network, as you see here. And that means we have now a smaller network and we have almost no overhead. And that means we get here significant, like an order of magnitude speed up by means of the semi parametric approach over um, the parametric approaches that we had before. Uh, so models be smaller due to a retrieval augmentation need to actually again and speed. So let me wrap up here. Don't learn samples in your powerful likelihood models. Um, rather utilize retrieval augmentation, which leads to smaller models, improved performance by having the powerful likelihood concentrate on what they're really great at learning compositions rather than memorizing samples. And that also provides you a convenient post hoc transfer of the models to enter any modalities. That I want to last time switch gears to the real question that I believe we should be asking ourselves, and that is making sense of the world, understanding the world just by means of vision. Essentially answering the children's question number one, what would happen if, yeah? What would happen if you would close one of these glasses down there? Now, luckily children do that typically more like the box of wood and so on. And with that, they ask these predictive coding questions than you that neuroscience is these days like super fond of trying to um, uh, make sense of the world there. But for us, besides understanding the world, which I find super interesting there out of that, it also means that we give computers additional abilities. And just assume you have a static image. Can I animate the static image by simply poking, pushing, or pulling on individual pixels, essentially hallucinating based on this very sparse interaction with the image, how the rest of the pixels will move about, Evidently, this is a heavily sort of underdetermined um, uh, task here, problem. And so there are different answers. So it's clear I need to embrace this domesticity there and sample the different realizations that I get. I want this to be uh, transferable to different instances of that category, meaning different persons. And I don't want to utilize a person model like simple model and whatever else has been developed there, because that would be specific for a particular uh, object class. I want this actually to work on arbitrary object classes after evident training um, on, on potted plants, then be able to do the same thing on potted plants as well. We need to solve or address two problems with that. And one is learning the kinematic interdependence. With that, I mean, if I pull here on one leaf of this potted plants, what implications would that have on other leaves? Yeah, what are the kinematic interdependencies between individual parts of that object? And the second is, I want to be able to generalize to novel objects, novel instances here that I haven't seen before. How do we do that? What we are provided with is a start frame and a terribly sparse signal. And just a mouse track on the individual pixel. It can also be several pixels, that doesn't matter. I mean, it be one, two, three, four, five, whatever. And what we want at the end of the day is a video sequence. And in between comes somehow a neural network, a decoder. I mean, that's also. Awesome. But it's clear that we cannot do a direct mapping of this input to this output because we only have input here, but we are lacking how the rest of the pixels should actually move about. So that we evidently need to learn. And for that, we introduce the uh, conditional and 
virtual neural network, which essentially says, if I want to synthesize these individual video frames as conditioning information, I have provided this sparse signal there, but it's clear I'm lacking all of these question marks. So I'm lacking a distribution from which I can sample what these individual question marks should be doing there. It's underdetermined there. So the uh, INN in that case is turning um, this kinematic representation you're sampling from that into video frames conditioned on the site information that I have so that it's compatible with the book here. And uh, then you put a recurrent uh, architecture afterwards to combine all of these individual frames and decode them. And you're in training, you're provided with frames from the video sequence. You encode them one by one into what you're having here. And because this is invertible, we can now turn that process around, take the individual frames and decode them or represent them in this distribution that we want to learn, conditioned on what we have, the sparse feedback. And then in inference, we can turn that process around and render the individual video frames. With that, we can pull on individual parts of the object there and have the approach uh, animate their behavior. You can um, take this part of lab here, say, I want to pull this down. And then there's evidently not a single answer, right? I'm just rendering the five different answers to, to show you the elasticity that you have and, and bring them in motion. You can do that for persons and so on. In the interest of time, I ever want to conclude with this um, part here and say that if you optimize that process, you can now ask questions. What would happen if I would pull on this particular pixel here? What would happen if I would pull here? Which other pixels would move with the one that I have called here? So essentially uh, answering this question, what are the kinematic interdependencies within that object without ever having seen a model or it provided a model there? The approach that helps you to figure out how the particular pixels are interdependent. With that, um, uh, one few tiny minutes here for the last topic that I actually want to talk about, and that is the dark matter of neural networks. As I pointed a time ago, um, what's the dark matter of neural networks? The dark matter of neural networks are the things that the neural network has chosen not to represent. So when I take an input image and I finally have this um, AlexNet here, for instance, shout out, it's a snow leopard. It's clear that on the way from here to there, much as in our visual cortex from the eyes uh, down to uh, the one before uh, all that way down there, a lot of information is lost. It's lost for good, yeah, because you want a whole lot of images to be classified as no letter, irrespective of what the background clutter is, the lighting, the posture, and whatever else. So it's clear that this network needs to, <laughs> that's, a, that's not a bug, that's a feature there, needs to be invariant, needs to learn to be invariant to a whole lot of things. Downside of that is you cannot turn that around. Uh, if I give you this representation, what image here? was the input image. I mean, that's evidently an underdetermined part there. Figuring out what that is, is tricky. And the question is truly, what invariances has this model actually learned? I mean, the only thing that we know is that it, whether it classifies something correctly, but what has it chosen to actually ignore? And I find particularly interesting because there are lots of domains that care about that. Let's say you need to get an MRI or you need to get a CT in that particular case here. Um, especially in CT, you care about doing this as a, at a low dose. Yeah? I mean, high dose would be great for the radiologist, but not for you. Uh, what you care at the end of the day, or, or you're doing um, you also do quite a bit of work um, in the life, uh, life sciences from focal microscopy uh, to pi microscopy and so on. There you want to avoid photo bleach. Yeah? So you don't want to take your probe and essentially <laughs> zap that by, by going like that at too high dose. But at the output side, you want to have a high dose or the equivalent of a high dose image, something with very high quality. Now, that's why all of these devices, CTs and so on, have inherently built in image enhancement algorithms. You don't see the raw pixels there, but you see improved pixels by means of denoising, deblurring, super resolution approaches, and the like. It's clear that this is not the same as what we're having here. This is the output of an algorithm. And the question that we are asking is, what structures has the algorithm chosen to ignore? What structures does the algorithm choose to invent which aren't there? What biases does, does such an enhancement algorithm have? What does it ignore? What does it invent which is not there? And I guess as a radiologist, 
pretty much care about and whether this structure is actually there or whether it's just imagined because hey i mean you look at a low dose image which just has seen let's say you, you look at something with a much lower resolution yeah eventually you need to take something tiny and make this large so you need to invent something you want to make sure that you haven't invented any disease or whatever else which isn't there or ignored one which used to be there and with that we come to recovering the environments that actually are there how can i take this thing here and figure out what the model has chosen to ignore i can always learn an epsilon approximate auto encoder a representation that is around this humble snow leopard here super perfect and gives me gives me exactly a perfect reconstruction as that we can see now how can i map this one here which is lacking a lot of details into this rich representation that you're having down here it's clear that they're not equal this one contains a lot more information than this one here you would need to invent imagine hallucinate all the information which is missing here the background the post all whatever else there is and that towards this tiny representation that we're having here combined they equal what we're having down here but how can we figure this part here out for that we introduce a conditional virtual neural network as we've seen before and with the idea if i take this here as conditional information and i want to get this out i need to invent uh, what was this plus here before i need to invent this part here so i need to invent this distribution so that samples from this distribution together with this give me the full representation that i'm having done now with the beauty that i can because it's a bijective mapping turn that around take my representation of this node effort here say hey i mean it looks in fc whatever fc6 it looks like this what's the difference and have the network figure out this distribution of, of residuals essentially uh, that i'm lacking now what you can do with that is you can sample from this distribution, fix this here, sample from this distribution, and see all the images which look identical to your neural network up there, and figure out that your neural network would not notice if your snow leopard sticks out the tongue edge. Yeah? This is the manifold of all the equivalence class of all samples under this FC6 or whatever representation that we're seeing up there. Okay, and with that, and can take my image enhancement algorithm, take the lower low dose image, whatever enhancement algorithm you have, and then take the CINN to learn equivalent samples and see that this enhancement algorithm here in this particular convolutional layer, for instance, would not even care about like whether this structure is there or not. So if I'm a radiologist and I see this thing popping up there, I need to really ask myself, is it there or not? Because for my neural network, all of these here would be identical. It's like you being colorblind, yeah? And here me putting in a red or a green dot, you said a red or a green dot, I mean, it's, it's the same thing. It's been there beforehand, right? I mean, it hasn't changed, right? And you said, wait a minute, it's red, it's green, it's red and green. So what are you talking about, right? I just see something great. And same thing here, this thing would not notice this blob being there or not. Or just imagine this being a tumor, this being whatever else, that, right? And you can do that for different layers in your neural network and then see on different layers whether there's something popping up or not. Now, I would have much more to share, but we don't have time, and that's why I'm wrapping up. Uh, sorry for those interested in 3D. It's just the uh, world is 3D, you just go out. Um, conclusion um, I don't think that just wrapping up models making them larger, powerful likelihood models and so on will be the solution in any near future. We need to combine um, the efficiency of inductive biases and conclusion in your networks, for instance, with the expressiveness of these powerful likelihood models. Um, I don't think that we should store everything in our very precious model parameters. Um, retrieval of approaches actually lead to simpler and improved architectures by having the powerful likelihood models concentrate on what they're great at learning compositions rather than learning samples by heart. Um, this IPOC approach that I just presented shows that we can actually utilize conditional invertible neural networks for learning kinematic interdependencies and the ambiguities. And by embracing a stochastic approach there, really get a hold of all the ambiguities out there in the world and cope with sparse user control and arbitrary objects out in the world. And last off, I think it's very important for our community also to not just ramp up model performance, but make sure that they're also interpretable, that we get in a sense of 
uh, what we have not learned, learn the invariances of models and um, explain them away so that we get a better understanding. With that, thank you for your attention. Thank my wonderful team for making all of this work possible. And if there are any further questions, I will be here, not for too long, but for a bit more. I'm happy to chat with you guys. Depending on Margot's uh, level of generosity, just a little bit longer. If we have time for one or two questions. Yes, come on. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah. Keep on back. Uh, I, I just think it's quite a question. Do you think retrieval augmentation is also the way to go for exports more more on a stack type of questions? Or do you think we can scale that basically? Do you think we can scale that I find it super interesting. I mean, you, you're pointing at a very important question there that gave me a bit of a headache. Also, at Dutch, we've been discussing this quite a bit. That it seems like presently we are ramping up. The vision, uh, the, the language models in these generative visual synthesis, much more than we're ramping up our visual models, yeah, more parameters and so on. Um, I find this odd. Maybe I'm just the vision person, think like, hey, vision 2D, 3D, 4D, yeah, and language, sorry, <laughs> one essential <laughs> problem. Now, again, like, I mean, that, that's the bias of a vision uh, person. We've all uh, come to, to cherish uh, what uh, ChatGPT and other language models were capable of doing. It's just awesome. And um, that's super complicated. And that's probably why these models actually need to be at the scale that they presently are at. I guess when we have um, more power there than probably the language models, uh, the, the visual side of the world would also take us even more in terms of parameter size. And let me go back to your question. I think that would be a very important thing to investigate there if the tokenization will change. Uh, so keeping the tokens as they are presently, I guess that is not the best way to go about, probably more like a hierarchical approach there. And then I could imagine that for true augmented approaches, that would also be interesting. Try to get a head, my head wrapped around that bit that not there. Yet. And I'm stacking the cluster that will <laughs> uh, With your retrieval on the nation part, um, earlier in the talk, you talked about how there's only one dimension, right? And uh, if you want to generate that, you have to see the dimension you're trained by. So, um, for the retrieval thing, uh, if you don't have this Da Vinci in your data set, and you know, maybe your data set doesn't have near neighbors that are similar to that painting, is that going to be a, a detriment to that approach? No, because I would never imagine that you retrieve on the level of entire images. That would be the Ayosha, the ultimate Ayosha approach. Yeah, you're a neighbor classifier. You want to render a Da Vinci, this infinite data set, and you just look it up. And there you go. Uh, no, we've done this on the level of patches, as I said, right? And if your patches just get smaller and smaller and smaller, you will eventually these patches will be useful for your surfaces. Shouldn't get too small. One by one, okay, pixel size is probably not very informative. But somewhere maybe you get the point, right? Somewhere in between that would be informative enough and shared. Thank you more. Do you think you are Sure, in the future, I mean, that would be super interesting, and that's 
That's what I'm ultimately excited about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was a bit surprised about your motivation for the retrieval. You said my precious neural network parameters and I can trade them towards storage, storing images, but I know like it's both space and aren't networks more efficient to store even at the patch level. So you mean like you could just ramp up the networks to so my understanding of your network essentially they compress the data set in, in some way. Yeah. So why do I go back to store storing pictures and not use a network to to compress. And yeah, maybe I need multiple networks which I then retrieve. Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised you go all the way back to yeah, pixel. Because exactly. like with Week you got, we've done exactly that, right? We compressed things in these parameters. Um, but we've sensed that you can only compress things so far. Yeah, eventually, like for instance, if you go too far, right? there you're losing like spatial abilities. And that's why I said beforehand, you don't want to do this for entire images. That would not make sense. I mean, that's exactly the compression that's happening in the light of the And I guess the, the misunderstanding where the different sides um, that you're taking on there, um, that is due to like us talking about a different scale that we're looking at the object. If you do this realistically on the level of the entire object, and we're talking about long range interactions and all of these things. And I very much believe that's what we have to generate all this data. However, when we do this on the level of more local structures in there, if it's getting too small, individual pixels agreed uh, that you also want to compress together. But somewhere in this mid range in between, it turns out that you have an awful lot of variation in there, which starts to become harder and harder to compress together. I mean, we tried it with BQ Gun. Sure, you could make this lot model then eventually larger and larger and larger. But then you have these problems that it will not fit on your graphics card. You will need to make some, some compromises there in order to get it together. You don't have if you go for the retrieval augmentation. That's the motivation in between. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah thanks. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you very much for an incredible talk. Again.